the one that stood out to me the most out of all the things you guys wrote. So we're going over our wins for the week, our positive focus for today is Antonio wrote, buyers seem more receptive this week to getting pre-approved and putting in offers. That's the one that stands out to me the most. And let me tell you why. Because what Antonio is saying there is buyers seem, seem, which is all Antonio's perspective, right? Like that's his feedback. That's what he's how he's interpreting what's happening, right? And I think it's important that we understand that is, is the market gonna fluctuate on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis? It's always gonna fluctuate. There's always gonna be different things happening and stuff like that. But it's important that we always come at it with the perspective that we wanna have about the market, right? Like we have a choice in how we see this market. Right. So Antonio, I'm using yours as an example because I like that you said buyers seem, um, you know, more receptive. But what if every day, no matter where the market's at, we can say, yeah, everyone's seeming more receptive. Buyers are receptive today, regardless if the rates are higher or lower or whatever, because sometimes we get in our own heads. Right. Sometimes. Like if there's changes in the market or we see things happening, we immediately will put, well, it's, I'm going to go up against this, this tough battle with buyers because the rates are higher, you know? So what I'm trying to say, guys, is we have to program ourselves to really like think the market's always good. It's always a good market. It's always a great time to buy. Buyers are always receptive when I meet with them, Right. And I want you guys to have that attitude because I think the attitude is important. It's important to have that attitude that no matter where the market is at, my attitude is that it's always a great market. It's always a great time to buy. It's always a great time to sell. There's going to be maybe some changes that I have to put into my arsenal of how I communicate with people. But regardless of what I, what, what the changes that I got to make or the tweaks that I got to make to how I communicate with people, it's always a great time to buy. Because really, right, when's the best time to buy, guys? When is the best time to buy? When you're ready. It's when you're ready. It's when it makes sense for you to buy. And when it makes sense doesn't have to do anything with the market. So I, I, that's, that's one thing I want to tell you. The best time to buy or the best time to sell has nothing to do with the market. Because people buy and sell because of life events and life changes and, and it's the best time for them because that's when they see that they should start buying a home or maybe they're at that age now where they want to start investing in their future or they've outgrown, you know, their current place or they have to downsize, you know, because they're retired now or their kids are out and now they got to downsize so they got to sell. So I want you guys to really have that attitude of that it's always a good time to buy it's always a good time to sell. I just have to be the best agent I could be at all times. I have to always be on top of my game. I always have to have the latest and greatest information. I have to be consistent in my actions every single day on making my calls, showing up, showing up to training, following up with my leads, tracking my numbers, doing all that stuff. You got to do all those things every day. And regardless of where the market's at, like you can still make a great living regardless if the market's up or down or whatever the news is saying. That does not matter. And it doesn't matter because I'm living proof of that. Like I started in this game when I was 20 years old. I'm going to be 39 in October. So it's 19 years in the game, right? And the market has changed throughout that time. It's changed. It's gone up. It's gone down. The rates were up. The rates were down. The market crashed, right? And like every single year, year over year, I've had success in the business. I've had success in the business because my attitude about the business, about like having that optimistic attitude, like, hey, no matter what, it's there's someone out there that wants to buy a home or wants to sell a home. I just got to go find them. And whenever the market changes, I just need to be the person that knows all that information. I need to be the person that knows my shit. I need to be the person that knows how to explain what's going on so I can help someone make an informed decision. You know, so I, I challenge you, Antonio, and I challenge the rest of the people 
um, listening on this call today to not say like today the buyers seem more receptive. I would challenge Antonio to think the buyers are more receptive because Antonio is stepping his game up and he's able to, to have really, really good conversations with buyers. They're more receptive because you're showing more value because you've been showing up to training and you've been putting in the work and you've been making the calls and you've been showing up and you've been following up and you're proving to these clients that no matter what, it's, it's a good time to buy and you're the guy they, sh they should work with. That's why they're more receptive. It's not because all of a sudden they're receptive, right? But who sees the difference in perspective there, right? Who sees the difference in like, they're gonna be receptive only sometimes because wherever the market's at, like that's us letting the market dictate our success, right? Versus like, no, the clients are always gonna be receptive. I just gotta find the right clients. I just gotta be consistent in my efforts. I just gotta be able to explain what's going on. And when I explain what's going on and when I bring more value to the table, then people are always gonna be receptive. Because now you're taking away your success's control from, from what's happening in the market to the external factors. And you're taking control of yourself and your business and how you show up. And there's proof all around you guys. There's people on our team who are killing it right now, who are getting deals and contract left and right, who are closing deals left and right, who are booking appointments left and right, even though the market is quote unquote shifting. And there are many agents out there who are not booking appointments and who are not closing deals and who are not having the success like you guys see. So what's the difference? Some people are just showing up at a higher level. That's what it is. Some people are just more consistent. But I, I want to say that, guys, because, uh, because I want you guys to have this attitude going forward that if you want to have a success in this business and you want to have longevity in this business, your mindset and how you look at the business and your optimism and all that stuff is extremely, extremely important. Because if you have that one little shadow of a doubt and it's going to come, but you got to get yourself out of that where, ah, this market's tough, right? And yeah, no, buyers are freaking tough to work with right now. Every buyer I talk to, you know, they want to lowball, you know, these buyers, like they think, you know, whatever. And these sellers are unrealistic and like all these different, and these rates suck, right? Like if you start having that, like playing those, you know, thoughts in your mind, like, is that going to get you closer to your goals or push you further away from your goals? Right? So now I'm not going to say that that's never going to come up because we're human, right? So these thoughts do are going to enter our mind. Every time, every time you encounter an obstacle or someone gives you an objection or someone tells you the rates are too high or whatever, it's going against what I just told you, right? Because you could be like, yeah, but Enrique, yeah, buyers are telling me this. Yeah, and they probably are. But what are you telling yourself is the question. What are you telling yourself when you show up to the office every day? Are you showing up saying, it's a great freaking day. The market's on fire. The market is hot. Like interest rates are awesome. Like there's a lot of opportunity today in this market, like for buyers and sellers. Like I'm freaking getting this. Like there's people all around me having success. There's people outside of our company having success. And if they can do it, I can do it. Or are you saying, nah, market's tough right now. Buyers are, you know, trying to lowball everything, right? Like what, what are you telling yourself? Because I promise you guys that that part of it, like the mindset part and like the attitude and what you say to yourself is just as important, if not more important than like the tactical skills you got to do. Like today we're going to go over how to run comps, but I can show you how to run comps and you could be the master at how to run comps. But if you don't believe in like your services and you don't believe the market's great or whatever, like you'll know how to run comps, but you won't show up like you should show up when you meet with clients. Like I can teach you the best script and I can teach you how to handle an objection but if you don't say it with the conviction and if you don't truly believe in what you do, even your comps will, will sound sad. That's what Diana wrote, right? Yeah, if you're sad about the market or if you're negative, like your comps are gonna sound sad. Your comps are gonna sound negative, right? I like that. That's good. We gotta coin that now. Even your comps sound sad, bro. 
how do your cough sound sad? That's pretty hard to do, right? Because think about it, like, think about this, like when you're gonna run comps, right? You learn how to run comps because you're probably gonna go out and explain comps to a client. So when you explain it to them, are your comps sounding sad? Or are your comps sounding like, oh, these are awesome comps, right? This is great. This is why we need to move forward. This is why we need to put the offer in. Hey, you're getting a good deal, right? Like, are you saying it in a positive, you know, in a positive manner or are, you sound, are your comps sounding sad? Right. So I like that you made that because it's a it's a nice little joke, but it will remind you, it'll trigger you to think of like, how am I sounding? Right. So I want to I want and here's the thing is. The attitude of gratitude and positivity and all that stuff, like it's something you have to program yourself to do on a daily basis. It doesn't come natural. Right. Like if anybody has studied psychology or, or knows about psychology and how the mind works, you will come up with four to five negative thoughts for every positive thought. That's just your, the way your brain works. Right. God built us brain, our brains with ego and a fight or flight mode and stuff like that. Because back then the caves, the cavemen, when they came out of their cave, right, they were looking for like a dinosaur trying to attack them or they were looking for like, you know, a snowstorm or they had to go out and hunt for their food. So our brains are programmed and wired to think like negative fear, protection, stuff like that. Your brains are not wired to wake up and think it's a great day to go sell some houses. It's not like a, it, your brain doesn't automatically do that. Raise your hand if you realize that, like if you realize that it takes work to have a positive attitude. does right but when you understand that and you make that part of your routine and you make that part of how you carry yourself and if that if that becomes a way you live your life right like we have a choice am i going to live my life always trying to look at the bright side right like if we make that choice that conscious decision i promise you it'll trickle off into other parts of of your life and it'll trickle off into your business because when you approach your clients and when you're explaining your comps, your, your comps are going to sound happy. They're not going to sound sad, right? So the reason we start off with positive focus every meeting is because it puts us in that mindset of thinking positive and thinking from an abundance uh, mindset and thinking things are good and great because that triggers you to now look at things from, you know, a half, your cup being half full instead of half empty but you got to do that with yourself on a daily basis. So let's, let's clap it up for ourselves real quick. If you guys can just unmute yourself real quick, let's make some noise because today we showed up. We're ready to go. We had a great week. We're sharing our wins. We got appointments. We got, we got deals coming. Buyers are always ready to receive what I got, what I got to tell them. Right. Antonio. Like buyers are always receptive. They don't just seem receptive this week. They're always freaking receptive because every time I come through, like I'm going to bring the heat and I'm going to bring that value. And my clients are always receptive to moving forward. Thanks for sharing that, Antonio. You helped us kick off our meeting, brother. Um, okay, let's talk about comps. How to run comps. Um, it's not rocket science guys, but you need to know how to run comps when you're trying to evaluate properties or see what you think a property could sell for or what you think you should make an offer at. So we're gonna turn over to the MLS right now. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll run through how to, how to do comps. Um, what are some things that you have to know when running comps? Put that in the chat real quick. What are the most important things? Like before you even get started with trying to run comps, what should you already know? Like what are, what's, what's the data you have to know? Pending and sold, quarter mile radius, square footage, property type, distance from the subject property. Yep. All that stuff. So those of you guys, some of you guys have run comps a lot. Some of you guys are newer to the game. Um, so anytime you're going to run comps, right? Comp stands for comparable sales, right? What we do when we're trying to evaluate what a home is worth, 
we are comparing our subject house, the house that we're trying to evaluate to what has sold around that house in the same neighborhood, a similar type of home, right? If you have a mobile home, you don't wanna compare that to a mansion, right? If you have a condo, we don't wanna compare that to a single family home. If we have a house in Willow Glen, we're not comparing it to a house in Blossom Valley, right? Two different neighborhoods. So just right off the bat, you gotta understand what the purpose is, right? The purpose is you have a client that's thinking of selling their home and they wanna know what the home could be worth. <laughs> you have a client that is looking to buy a home and they wanna know what offer should I make then by us running comps, right, is going to be, it's going to give us a starting point. It's going to give us um, an educated uh, an estimate of, right, of what we think the home can sell for, right? It's not an appraisal. It's, a, it's an informal appraisal, right? Because none of us are licensed appraisers, but appraisers do a similar process. They just go a lot more in depth. Um, but it's basically our, our way of doing kind of an informal appraisal on the property. So in order to properly evaluate you know one home and compare it you need to know about the current home right you need to know about that home you're going to want to know you know the size the square footage the lot size you're going to want to know the the property condition uh, if you've been to the property that you no know, that's going to give you a lot more information or if you have pictures online that you can look at to see the the condition of the property um, you want to know what type of home it is right so all the stuff to do with that home, right? You want to know that home because now you know what you can compare it to. If you don't know the square footage of, of a property, you can't just guess, right? So how do we figure that out? So we're going to pull something up right now um, as our starting point. What I usually do, and then some of you guys can chime in, is anytime I'm going to run comps on a property, I will always do a Google search of that property and I'll pull up like a Redfin or a Zillow or I'll go on a uh, the Chicago title property profile and pull up like the county records um, to see what that property is all about, to pull up the property profile. The reason I like using like Redfin is because Redfin has a section where it says public records and they basically pull the information for pub from public records. So, and it might have more information. It might have photos and stuff like that. So uh, Redfin is a, a good uh, resource. There's tons of them out there. Some of you guys wrote Realist. There's your property profile on your um, Chicago title, they give you your own login and stuff. But no matter what, like you should be looking up the profile of the property, right? So that's what we're gonna do right now. So let me share my screen real quick. So we're gonna pull up. Let's see. It's one of our listings that we have right now. I'm looking at one. Um, I think Carla got this one in contract. 4550 Sneed, Sneed Drive. That's a very hard to comp. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's actually a good story to tell. Okay, perfect. We'll use a real life example. So this is the property that Carla has in contract right now. Um, 4550 Sneed. So usually what I'll do, I'll just Google and I'll see what pulls up. Um, I like Redfin just because the interface is a little bit better in my opinion, or it's a little easier to use, but I usually will look at Redfin. I'll open that up in another tab. I'll open up um, Zillow. And then I even use RPR. Anybody use RPR? Um, for being a realtor, you get access to this right here. And it takes like all the info from your property profiles and stuff like that. And it's gonna show MLS information on RPR as well. So that's the difference because this is like a site you have to log into. Um, it's gonna show you some of the MLS private remarks because this is all connected to the MLS. So RPR is a good one. All right, so here's what I'm gonna look at, right? First, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at the property. I'm gonna look at the description. Um, RPR already gives us uh, their own evaluation, you know, so we can kind of take that with a grain of salt, but I see it's a five bed, it's a five bath, 3,200 square feet, 3,230, it's a 9770 square foot lot, it's a single family home, 
and then you could even read the the description because sometimes they'll put more information in the description. And then some property facts as well. What's good about this is you see what's public facts. Public facts are going to be um, what is coming from county records. And then listing facts is going to be what the agent entered on the listing. So that's the two different things. And most of it looks the same. Five, 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 five. So that means the public record shows up, living area. But here's a discrepancy I see right here, the lot size. Public records show 10,080 square feet and the listing agent put 9770 square feet. So it's off, it's off by a little bit. That's a, that's a few hundred square feet difference in the lot size. Uh, do you know anything about that, Carla? Um, I think that's going to be the front yard. Um, it's on waste. So basically this property, the lot size is about 97. That's including two car garages. The discrepancy is coming from the front yard. That's unusable space. So once they do the renovation, it's going to be about 10,000 almost. So that's the discrepancy. Got it. Okay. So it's good to know these things, right? Because if the more that you know, then you can kind of use that. Now, this lot size right here, 9,800 versus 10,000, it's a couple hundred square feet difference. Is that going to make a huge, huge uh, difference in the price of the home? Not really. Um, you know, but if it was like thousands of square feet difference, then yeah, that could, that could make a big difference. A couple hundred square feet on this size of a lot is not going to be that big of a deal. Um, it does hold some weight, but it's, it's, it's going to be nominal. Um, and then I look at schools as well. I want to know like what schools are in that, because when I'm comparing it to other homes, if you're like, sometimes you can cross like a street or cross the railroad tracks and it's a better school district. And that can make a difference in the prices. So when you're looking at comps in a certain like radius, let's say you're doing like a circle around that home, but one, these ho the houses on the right side are a different school district with a lot better um, schools and yours is on the other side, you'll probably be able to see the difference in the prices of what homes are selling for. So it's also good to know what the schools are at. And then you can look at stuff like the history, like where it was sold, where it was listed at. You can see this one was listed from 2.6 and they dropped, they dropped it. And what are we under contract for? Um, Carla, is it 2-2? Two, two? Um, so just some context, this property, I think listed about 2.6 originally because the seller feels the property is worth 2.6 and they did a huge price reduction for 2 million about 30 days ago. And we offered, we had like, oof, we had like three days of countering. Uh, it started about 2.2 million. We started off at 2 million 87. The seller countered about 2.350. And we ended up about 2.2. And appraisal came in about, you want me to tell the appraisal? Not yet. Yeah, you can. That's fine. Um, the appraiser came in at 2.275. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, 2.275. Um, okay, good. So that's the thing. A lot of times you're not going to have some of that information because when you're trying to comp out a property, it's usually going to be before the sale. So for the sake of this, you know, you guys are going to be able to understand it from both sides of it. Um, so yeah, knowing that is, is helpful, but how we got there is what we're going to look at, right? So I'm going to look at the photos as well. So I'll pull up the photos and I'll start skimming through the photos and I'll kind of ev evaluate how this property looks. And what I'm looking for, like, is it a fixer upper? Is it original? Is it remodeled or upgraded? Does it have like a pool? Does it have any extras, right? Now, so just looking at all this, it seems in pretty good condition. It seems remodeled. Now here's the thing too with remodeled, right? Like if it was remodeled within the last 10 years or so, and then you have a property that's like remodeled today that looks a lot more modern. As long as it's remodeled and it's moving ready, I don't think that's gonna make a big difference. Like when an appraiser does an appraisal, they're still gonna consider both properties upgraded, right? So it's more of like, has it been upgraded? It's not necessarily, do you like the upgrades, right? And I think that's some sometimes when people get caught up on like, oh, that looks like an old school remodel or like, no, this one has the white cabinets that's more modern. That's not necessarily gonna change the price. 
as long as the property is in a similar condition. It's not necessarily which style do you like more. Hey, Enrique, do you know my clients? Because exactly what they're going for. This actually, this property was remodeled uh, in 2011 and it didn't fit the aesthetic. They were, you'll see when you run the comps, there's one that's super modern. Actually, this is a good exercise for everybody. Yeah. But see, when I look at this, even though it's a little more old school, I can tell it's older because of the colors and stuff, but it's still clean. It still has newer cabinets, the shaker cabinets. It still has granite counters. It has the stainless steel appliances. It has the crown molding. It has the lights. It has all that stuff. So even if you showed me like a newly remodeled one, like that's modern, to me, it's the, it doesn't change the value. They're both remodeled, right? It's more of like, which one do you like more? Um, so I would consider this remodeled. And that's important because when you look at other properties, you don't want to let your opinion of what looks nicer, like influence whether you use it as a comp. So yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I can just go through some of these photos and I would, this is going to be a remodeled property. So when I'm looking at other properties, if there are other remodeled properties, that's what I want to compare it to. Sometimes you may not have other properties to compare it to that are exactly like yours either. So that's the part where you got to kind of figure those things out. Okay, so this is a remodel property. So now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the MLS and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a search in the matrix here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in, do a map search where I put the property address. So I just copied it and I pasted it here and it pops up the location. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off at a quarter mile radius. Anytime you're running comps, you always want to try to go as close to the property as possible. And then if there's no comps, then you can start expanding out a little bit further. But it's always best to start off at a quarter mile and see what you have. See if you have some good comps. What I'm looking for is I want to look for any properties that are active, anything that's contingent or pending. So I'll highlight those. Anything that has been sold. And I'll highlight those top four. Then my close of escrow date, I'm usually going to go back 90 days, but because we're like the market has been changing over the last 90 days, you may want to give, if there's comps that are newer, that are like 30 days, you might want to give more weight to those, but 90 days is typically what an appraiser will do. So I usually will go 0-90. So when you put 0-90, it's a shortcut instead of you having to go here and click on the dates and stuff like that. If you just put 0-90, it's basically saying I'm going to go zero days back all the way to 90 days back. We know this is a single family home. So I'm going to check single family. And then I'm usually going to start off just with the square footage. So this square footage is 3230 square feet. So now we always want to look at a range of square, of square footage because you're not gonna necessarily find a property that is the exact square footage. You wanna have something that's comparable. So usually like plus or minus 20% is kind of a rule of thumb. So if I were to do my calculator and say 3,200 square feet minus 20%, that's about 2,560. So I'm just gonna round it to an even number. So I'm gonna go 2,500. And then if I go 3,200 square feet plus 20%, that gives me 3,840. So I'm going to do 3,800. So what I want to look at is I want to look at properties that are between 2,500 to 3,800 square feet, which is approximately plus or minus 20% from our subject property. Um, I already got the map. I already know what statuses I'm looking for. Uh, I already know the uh, how many days back I want to go, 90 days. And then if I look here, I'm going to see what pulls up. So right here, there's only one match. So like, like Carla said, this property is hard to comp out, probably because it looks, it looks like they've done a lot of custom remodeling to it. They probably did an addition or something. Um, so that's why it's going to be hard to comp. There's no, actually only one property. So when I click on that one, uh, hit search. It's only our subject property that's coming up, right? There's no comp. So sometimes this will happen is you get, like you run comps for a property that's kind of unique. And then you got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how you can get more comps. So since there's, since there's no comps, basically, I'm going to go back to criteria and I'm going to expand a little bit more now. 
So now instead of 20, uh, 0.25, I'm gonna go half a mile out. And now I see there's two matches. So I'll click results. And there's one right here. There's an active one. It's active at 2.998. Different home. But remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to find homes that are the most comparable to our subject property. Um, I'll go back a little bit more because I want more comps. I always want to have at least three, three to maybe six comps is what I'm looking at because that'll give me a good indication. If I only have one, it's really hard to go off one. An appraiser is always going to have like three like main comps and then they'll probably have three other like backup comps to help support it. So we have two choices here is we can try to expand the area a little bit or we can go further back in date. So I might want to go further back in date because I don't want to go too far out where I go out of the neighborhood. So I'm going to start playing with the date here. So instead of going 90 days back, I'm going to go 120 days back. And now it gave me three matches, right? We know one of them was our, our current property. So if you look here, three matches. And one of them is the subject property. So we only have two comps. So let's go back a little further. I'm going to go all the way back six months. So I think six months might be the maximum that appraisers might go back. But we know six months ago, the market was different than it is today, right? So it's, it's a little, it's going to be kind of tough. So let's see what we got here. We got four matches. We have this one on Billings a lot newer of a property, 18 years old, uh, 2,600 square feet, so it's a lot smaller. We have this other one. We have our subject property. We have this other custom one right here, sold 2.275. So out of those three properties, guys, which one seems like this one right here looks like it was like a smaller home in a neighborhood and they did like some remodel to it, right? They added on to it, which is kind of what our property looks like, right? Like our property was like a smaller one and you can tell they did like this addition on it, right? You can see like they built all this stuff on the back. And if I click on map, you can also see where the comps are at, right? So when you look at the map, this is our subject. You got these ones over here that are kind of like in a different area. Those are like those newer ones that we saw. And then you got this one over here on Rambo that's more similar to our property. It's like an older home that they remodeled and added on to. So to me, this one's gonna be more comparable versus like these ones that were built a lot newer and they're just, they're more you know newer, construction and stuff like that. So I'm gonna see if there's anything else in this neighborhood, like on this side, that is more comparable. So we can go back, like, we can look at our square footage as well. Like we're, we have a broad range, so we can start expanding this, like 2000 square feet, all the way up to, uh, we'll keep 3,800 max. Now I got eight matches. So if I look at the map again, there's some other ones that pulled up. So let's look at this one right here. Um, let's go back to my results. Three bed, two bath. This looks like a new construction, newly built custom home near Rivermark. So two thousand sold for two million, and this one looks like they basically went to this old neighborhood, and they probably, if you can see from the photos, or you can maybe even pull up like a Google Maps view, it's probably an older neighborhood where they just built some new homes in that older neighborhood. 
So here's what I'm going to tell you guys right off the bat. Like this property right here that we're trying to compare, like eight, like Carla said, this is a hard one to comp out. The reason it's hard is because it's a unique property in the sense that they have an old home that they basically built out really big in this neighborhood. And that's the problem you get when you're trying to take an old home and like make it way bigger than every other home is you're not going to get that full, full value of the property, right? Because it doesn't conform to the rest of the homes. Uh, for those of you guys that are just getting started with running comps, like this would be a harder one for you to comp and you'd probably ask for help with this. And if we look at the uh, price history, that's probably also why they started the price so high at 2.6. And then they slowly started backing it down. And what'd you say that it, it, it came out to 2.3 or 2.275? Um, 2.275. Yeah. So more than likely what the, um, I think they used Rambo as the main comp because that one is comp. about five bedrooms. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit, it was really difficult to comp because you're battling out with the seller's expectations on what they want or they feel about the property and based on the data. Yep. So if I were to pull up like, what, now what we're going to do is we're trying, what we're trying to do is we're pulling up all the data and then we're trying to narrow it down to the comps that make the most sense that are most comparable to our property, right? So what I would do is I'd go back to these comps, right? And I'd start checking the ones that were the most comparable. So this one is like a newer home, right? It's eight years old. It's in an older neighborhood. It's comparable in the sense where it's like they remodeled it and it's a brand new home, but it's not comparable because it's, it's also brand new. So let's look at like this other one, like this one, this is a whole different neighborhood, the Rivermark area. So knowing the neighborhood and the boundary lines is gonna be important as well. Um, this one right here, same thing. This is like a newer home. You can tell these are all just newer homes here. So 1.4, this is a lot smaller, right? A lot smaller, there's only one photo. So you really have Rambo, that's like your best one. And I think that's probably what the appraiser did is he just looked at Rambo um, and said, okay, that one sold in April, which is, you know, a few months back. It's a five bedroom, four bath, and it's 3,400 square feet, which is pretty close to ours, 3,230 square feet. So if we look at that one, that one probably has the most weight because it's an older home that they built onto. It was built 45 years ago. They've added on to it. It's in the similar neighborhood, right? Not too far away. It's kind of the same type of home. And that's how you came up with that one. I don't think this wasn't a, the best example, guys. It's a hard example, but it also gives you some perspective of what you might run into because you might run into some where they're not cookie cutter. And you got to kind of do your homework. It's not as common to run into properties like this, right? Because a lot of times you're just dealing with homes that are really similar to other homes. But when you're able to kind of look at these and, and, and know how to decipher them, it's going to make you better at running your cookie cutter comps. I so, would also point out to Enrique exactly what you just said. I think repetition for me all these years of just doing comps made me realize like, oh, if, even though there is another property that's very unique as this, you can get a sense of how to solve more problems and you have answers to everything and you have to trust, you know, your networks and how would they actually comp the property. So it's really helpful to do more comps, comp in your own house, your neighbor's house, everyone. Repetition is key. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's the thing is, like she said, repetition is key. And when you have a property like this, where it's really hard to comp out, you're making like an educated guess, you know, that's what it is because you don't have any like clear cut data. You only have one property that's kind of similar. So you're saying, okay, that one was at 2.275. That one was a little bit bigger, right? That was several months back when the market was a little more competitive. Um, so what I think we should offer on this one is going to be maybe starting on the lower end and then letting them counter us. So what did you start off with your offer at, um, Carla? Um, I started about 2,087. Okay. 
So and the seller countered, yeah, two million eighty-seven. Seller countered two point three five, kind of steep. Yeah. And we countered back at two million one eighty. Uh, actually, yeah, two million one eighty. And then he countered back like, nope, it's gonna be two point three. That's my final. And then we countered back like, hey, we're just gonna walk away if you don't take it at two point two. And he gave in. <laughs> two point two, right? So yeah, I mean, based off of that, 2.2, yeah. I mean, you don't have a lot of data to support it, but you see like outside of the neighborhood, there's homes that are selling for more that are the newer homes. Within this neighborhood, there's a home that's kind of a similar, you know, odd home, a unique home like this one that's over 2275. So 2.2, like it doesn't seem like you're way out of the ballpark, right? You only had really like one solid comp to kind of judge that one on. But Carla's tactic was to use that in her favor, right? To start off lower. And then they kind of countered back and forth. And then they ended up on a price that worked for both sides, right? And you're going to have that a lot of times when you have these unique properties. It's, it's, if you're trying to get the best deal for your buyer, like start off a little bit on the lower end and then let them, you know, counter you, right? And then you also probably got to go off how much interest is in the property. Carla, did you have, were there other offers you were competing with on this one? Um, for this one, I think they were... No, there was none. So the seller was really eager. Yeah. And, and I knew the answer was probably no, because it's such a unique property, right? When someone's moving into this area and all the other homes are a lot smaller, there, no one's ever looking for that humongous property in the area with small homes, right? Like it's a certain type of family. And maybe they were attracted to this one because they have a bigger family. It's a five bedroom. So it's, it's going to take the right type of buyer for this particular home, right? So it's, it's a lot of educated guessing. Now I'm going to run another scenario with an easier one, right? A little more of an easier one, one that you'll run into uh, probably more often. Um, so let's pick another home here. And let's see. What's another home right now that we have in contract? I'm going to pull something out. Let's just do this. Um, we're going to just clear this and we're going to start off with another scenario. So I'm going to see what's active right now, single family, and I'm just going to pick a zip code. 95123. And I want a single family and I want like your standard three bed, two bath property. There's 19 homes for sale. And then I'm just going to pick one of these and we're going to run comps on it. Um, so like your standard three bed, two bath, if you look at the square feet, like kind of 1,072 all the way up to 2,000, something right in the middle is kind of your average. So we'll say like this one here, Pineland Avenue. Okay. So this is going to be our subject property. Three bed, two bath, 1,400 square feet, 6,500 lot size. This is like a standard type of home, right? This is kind of your typical uh, three bed, two bath home. This is in the Blossom Valley area. So I'm going to do the same process that I went to. I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to pull up the Redfin link. Uh, pull up Redfin and I'll pull up RPR. So RPR, I'm going back here. I'm going to search for this one. So here we go, Pineland Avenue. All right, let's look at this home. So. 6093 Pineland Avenue, listed for 1.299. So let's say your buyer is interested in submitting an offer on this one. The RVM, this is what RPR is telling you it's worth, 1.449. It's a three bed, two bath, 1409 square feet, 6,500 lot. Some Blossom Valley. If you look at the public facts and the listing facts, everything pretty much matches up. 
which is good. Built in 1971. The schools, it's the Eastside Union High School, Oak Grove Elementary, Herman Middle School, Santa Teresa High School. All right, cool, let's comp this one out. So let's look at the photos first. So we'll look at these photos. And what we're looking for is this like a fixer upper? Is it original? Is it updated? Is it semi updated? So tiled kitchen, white cabinets, granite counters, recessed lighting, stainless steel appliances, hardwood floors. It's staged, it's marketed well, right? That's the other thing too, is, is homes that are marketed better, like when they're staged and the photos look decent and all that stuff, they're typically gonna sell for more. Um, so that also plays a role. Is this property like immaculate? Does it like the best property I've ever seen? No, but would this be considered like a, an updated property? Would you guys consider this updated? Yeah, it's updated and it has a pool. It has solar as well. You can see the solar it has new windows, right? Then I don't know how new they are, but they're the double paint, dual pane windows. So overall, this property is it's clean. It's a clean property. Maybe stylistic wise, this isn't like your favorite one, but this is a clean property, right? So I would say this is, I would consider this one updated when I'm looking for comps. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back here and we are gonna go to our criteria. We're gonna clear this out and we're gonna do a radius search of this property. So 6093, right here in the map selection, Pine Land Avenue. Here we go, we'll click on that one. And then we're gonna start with a quarter mile out. We're doing active contingent. So if you hold your shift button, active contingent, pending and sold, select all those. And we want properties that sold within the last 90 days. So we'll go 0 90. We're comparing single family homes. And then square footage. This square footage on this one was 1409. So if I'm going to go plus or minus 20%, so if I go 1409 or just 1400 minus 20%, that's 1120. I'm just going to round down to 1100. And I'm gonna put a dash and then I wanna go 1400 plus 20%, 1680. So I'll round that up to 1700. So I'm looking for comps that are active, contingent, pending and sold, that sold in the last 90 days, single family homes, and the square footage is between 1100 to 1700. And I'm going a quarter mile out from my subject property. And if I look here, there's four matches. So now I go to results. It's gonna include our subject property and then I'm gonna go through these comps. So I'm gonna to go to the next one. So you got this one that's active. We'll look at the photos here. Semi remodeled. Yeah, it's remodeled. They did some upgrades, some of the stuff's original. So I think this is a good comp, right? This is an active comp. We always wanna look for solds. Um, this one sold 1.56 and it sold in June 3rd. Let's take a look. There's something going on with this garage here. They did some sort of garage conversion. But let's look at the condition of the property. This would be considered remodeled, right? It has newer floors, newer paint, it's staged. The kitchen, they painted the cabinets. It doesn't have granite or anything, but it has tile. This is not a bad comp. Some stuff they did really nicely. Some stuff they just kind of cleaned it up a little bit. So I'd select this comp as well. 
Let's go to the next one. You got this one on Indian. And this is an active, I believe. Has a pull. So you see guys, what I'm doing is I'm just looking through the comps. I'm looking through the comps. I'm looking at the photos. I'm saying, okay, it's not exactly like ours, but it's similar condition. Now, if this was a complete fixer upper, then I wouldn't include it. But there's some stuff that's remodeled. It has hardwood floors. They did new paint, has some recessed lighting, stuff like that. So, okay, we'll keep this one. And so when I go back and look at my one line display here, you only got one sold comp. So I want at least three sold comps. So I'm probably gonna have to go back on my criteria a little bit and try to expand this search a little bit more. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go back in time. So I'm gonna go back 120 days. Now I have seven matches. There's a few more solds here. So I'm gonna do the same process. I'm gonna look back at these. Boom, I'll look at a couple photos. Okay, this one's remodeled. Boom, I'll select that one. This one looks remodeled as well. Okay, I'm gonna select that one. That's our subject. This one on Santa Mesa. Similar, semi-remodeled, there's some upgrades in it. So I'll select that one. So that's three sold comps already. And then all these other ones are just the active ones that we pulled up. So I'll just select all the active ones. And then what I usually do guys is once I select all my comps, so I got three active and I think I got three sold. If you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see something called a quick CMA. Is there a modern quick CMA? I haven't seen this one, but when you click on, you click all your criteria, all the properties you select, and then you, you click on quick CMA, it's gonna give you this breakdown right here where it puts them all in a chart. And this is what's gonna give you a visual of what they look like, what the averages are, sales price to list price ratio and stuff like that. So if we look at the top section, you have your actives, so currently you have yours here, 1.298, that's active. You have this other one, 1.399, that's active. And then down here, you have your solds. And you can look at these. Our property was 1,400 square feet. So you'll see like right here, you have a 1,223 square feet, listed 1,299, sold for 1,645 back in May. This other one, 155, sold in May, a little bit smaller. You got one right here, 1.735, which is really similar to ours. Three bed, two bath, 1409 square feet. That was back in May as well. You got this one right here, uh, 1495 square feet, has an extra bedroom. Sold for 156. So based off what you have being sold, guys, you can see right here on this chart below, you have the median price, 1.6. You have the minimum, 1.55. Let me make this a little bit bigger. You have the maximum, 1735, and you have the average, 1622. What would you guys say this property is worth, more or less? One point six. So here's the thing, right? Is 
when properties are going up in value, like this is the tricky part right now with the, with the way the market's going right now, because the market right now in some areas, the properties are going, are going down, right? Or they're selling for less or they're sitting on the market a little bit longer. So you also have to keep in touch with what's happening on, on the market, right? Like this one right here, our subject property on Pineland, it just went on the market. So it's a brand new listing. 1.298 is what they listed it at. So they listed it low because you have a comp that just sold. Uh, 1495 square feet. Four, one, five, six is what it sold for. I'm sorry, you know what? I didn't even include our subject one. Give me one second. Let me go back to this. I didn't include our subject property. So I'm gonna include our subject property in there and redo this quick CMA. All right, here we go. So we have our property, which is the top one, three bed, two bath. It's been on the market 46 days, 1409 square feet, listed for 1299. You have this other one that just came on the market, zero days on the market, 1298 right? It just went on the market a little bit bigger, 1495 square feet. You have this other one right here, been on the market 16 days, a little bit larger, 15, 16 square feet listed at 1399. So if I was going to make an offer on this house, knowing that it's been on the market for 46 days and it hasn't sold yet. And this one over here has been on the market 16 days and it hasn't sold yet. I probably wouldn't be as aggressive. So I would be coming somewhere closer to the list price. But I do know that in the past, in the last few months, there were comps that sold 1645, 1550, right? The average price is 1.6. We're listed at 1.3. Now, is the market as strong as it was back in May or, or back in June as far as the prices? The, the homes are not selling for as much as they were back then. And we also know that if the home sold in May, that means it was on the market in March or April. That's when they listed the property. So you also got to take that into account. So in March or April, we still saw a lot of offers coming in, right? It's only been over the last couple of months that the offers have kind of slowed down. That's when the rates started going up, stuff like that. So the price of this house is going to lie somewhere, I think, between close to list price or the average, it's somewhere in there. Right now it's kind of a ballpark. We don't know exactly where. So what I would be doing is I would be talking to the listing agent saying, hey, do you have any offers on this property? I'm gonna to try to gather as much information and use that as leverage. Do you have any offers on this property? If they don't have any offers, then I'm not gonna to try to submit a crazy old offer, right? Now I'm doing what Carla did is I'm kind of starting at the lower end and seeing what I can get. So I would say, hey, four, uh, 46 days on the market, 1.299, it's still sitting on the market. My clients like the property. I might come in at 1.225, 1.25, and kind of start there and see, where, see what they come up with. We know there's comps that support a higher price, but they were a few months ago and the, the property values have softened since then, right? So it's one of those things where we might wanna start a little bit lower and kind of work our way backwards. Now, if the market was where it was like last year, when like one home went on the market and it was sold within a week and every single time the comps were going higher and higher and higher and higher, then it would be the reverse approach, right? Then we would be asking how much activity do you have? How many offers are you competing with? And we know that if there's five or six offers coming in, we're going to probably have to start bidding over the last comp. So it's a different approach depending on the market, depending on the activity. So this is where you're going to run the comps you're going to gather as much information from the listing agent, and then you're going to determine what the best approach is on submitting your offer. The less activity that a property has, if the property's sitting on the market, then you're probably not going to have to be as aggressive on your offer. If it's a property that's getting a lot of activity, there's multiple offers, and now you're competing, you know you're going to have to push your offer a little bit higher. So it's not so straightforward where you're just Here's the, pro here's the comps, submit the offer, right? That's the starting point. And what we got to remember is at the end of the day, how much is the property worth? What's that saying? What someone's willing to pay for it. 
but someone's willing to pay for it, right? Because it's based off supply and demand. So right now in that same neighborhood, there's three properties that are for sale that are all kind of within the ballpark, right? From 1299 to 1399, they're all semi-remodeled, you know, or remodeled. Some are a little bit nicer than the others, but there's three to choose from. And there's two of them that have been sitting a little bit and one that just came on the market. So the property is always gonna be worth what someone is willing to pay, right? And the comps are gonna give you like your starting point. And it's gonna vary depending on where the market is at at that point. If the market is trending upwards, then you're probably gonna to have to be overbidding and, and outbeating the last guy. If the market is trending downwards or, or it's softening, then your starting point is gonna be a little bit lower. So I would say to summarize it, one, two to one, two, five is probably where I would start. Um, if you can get it at list price and you got comps that were still in the one fives a few months back, that's still a good deal. It's probably going to appraise for more because we're like in this transition right now. I know we're a little bit over time, guys, and this, this thing can go on for a long time because comps is something you can like really dig into. But I want to give you guys a good starting point of how to understand how to run comps, how to understand criteria. And this is one of those things where you're not gonna get it overnight. You're gonna have to run comps for different properties. You're gonna have to be in different situations and stuff like that. But at least you have a foundation of, of what you gotta do to run comps. If you're a, a newer agent, what I would do if I were you is, because we wanna teach you how to actually do this on your own, right? Is uh, If you have a property that your client's interested in, I would run comps. Or let's say you're gonna show a house today and you're going to meet a client, a Zillow flex lead, or whatever it might be, run comps on that property, right? Take that property, do exactly what I did, run comps, get your quick CMA, and you try to figure out more or less what you think the property is worth. And then I would go take that information to a senior agent or a more experienced agent who's done this a bunch of times and say, hey, I ran comps on this one. I'm going to go show it today. This is what I think it's worth somewhere in this ballpark. This is why. What do you think? Right. And that's going to, I think if you do that enough times and you're in enough scenarios, eventually it's, it's you know, you're, you're going to be able to kind of work your way through it. But it's a moving target, guys. It's not, it's not like a one size fits all, but there's fundamentals that fit all, right? Of making sure the property is similar, similar type, all those different things that we did in the criteria. Um, let's, let's spend five minutes on questions, guys. Any questions and then we'll wrap up. Anybody have any questions on, on this exercise today? Let's flip it this way. What's the key takeaway from today for those of you guys that on, on what you learned today? What's one of the things that stood out the most? Put it in the chat. Diana wrote, take comps when you show a home. Yeah, that's an awesome thing to do, right? Because if you show up to a, a showing, let's say you got a, a Zillow Flex client or a client you just met or a client you're trying to build that relationship with and credibility, if you take comps to your showing and you did your homework and you're able to now explain to them, hey guys, I wanna make sure you know we made our time useful today. So I ran comps before this. I looked at all the other properties. This one's for sale. This is the difference in that one. And you know the area and you're able to explain that. How much more valuable are you gonna to look to that client as opposed to just showing up and opening the door and showing them the property. Yep, so comp out the property. Uh, Mauricio wrote, the market's always a moving target and our comps are still an educated guess. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's an educated opinion. Because it's value, right? You put value on something based off what someone's willing to pay for it. And that's gonna fluctuate depending on where the market's at, supply and demand and how aggressive people are being. What else in the chat, guys? What's one takeaway from today? Yep, try to have at least three properties to compare. Not all comps can be run the same. You guys saw two different scenarios, one with like a really unique property, one with more of a cookie cutter track home. 
use three sold properties. Yep, always try to have three sold properties that are the most similar. Um, when in doubt, expand your search distance or expand the close of escrow, right? So yeah, start with the narrower distance, expand the close of escrow first before you start going outside of the neighborhood. Yeah, the need to stress that our clients that Zillow's algorithms can only be so good. CMAs are an art, right? So what Zillow does, guys, like the ones, those automated ones, they just basically take the data, but they're not necessarily going through the photos and saying, this is a good comp. This is not a good comp. This is why this one's better. This one's way different. It's really just taking kind of averages. And sometimes those averages can be thrown way off if you have like one property that sold way high or one property that sold way low. So that's why going through each property and looking at the photos and all that stuff and figuring out, okay, these are the best comps. That's how you get the most accurate. Sold, active, pending, contingent, which one would be the best to use? So sold is always going to be the best comps. Active, pending, and contingent is going to tell you where the market is trending, right? Because you can have a bunch of actives and until it sells, it's not, a, it's not, it doesn't set the bar, right? The bar is always changing. So once it's sold, then the new bar is set either up or down. If it's active, if it's pending, if it's contingent, that can help you determine is the market trending up? Is it trending down? And then also with your pendings and contingents, let's say you have a property that's really hard to comp. You can call the listing agent on any ones that are sold or active or pending. And you can also ask them, hey, how many offers did you get? What's your interest been like? You know, do you have any offers yet on this one? I'm trying to comp out another one. Because that's also gonna tell you where the market's going as well, right? So don't be afraid to call other agents that have properties that are active or even in contract. Let's say there's one that's pending in the same neighborhood and that's a good comp for you. You can say, hey, what did you, what price are you pending at? I'm putting an offer on this one down the street and I kind of, I want to gauge kind of where it's at right now. And most of the time, guys, nine out of 10 times, the agent will tell you where they ended up at. All right, guys, like I said, practice makes perfect. Go out there, try this on your own. If you need my help and you like, you want to run comps on your own house or a property that you're working on and you want to send it to me, I can also help you guys as well and say, Hey, this is what I think it's worth. But remember, you're not going to get good at this if you don't take the time to run comps. That's how you get good at running comps is you just got to run comps, right? This is just the classroom. Now you got to go apply it to the real world, real life scenarios. All right, guys, that's all we got for today. We'll see you soon. Let me know if you need anything. Thank you.